You know, as far as we know, every single human being who has ever been born, has ever lived on this planet, has been given one. Every person alive has one. In fact, the first thing you're given when you're born, and you have to have it so it can be duly recorded before you leave the hospital. You know what I'm talking about? A name. That's right. Have you ever thought about how important names are. Some people would say their most important thing about you is your name. You need a name for a birth certificate. You need a name for a driver's license, for a credit card, to buy a house, to get a job. A name is serious business. Some people don't think so, however, because some people have given some names to their children that seem to make light of this fact of how serious a name actually is. For instance, and these are actual people with these names. For instance, our good friend Bud Light. Do you know Bud? Don't raise your hand if you do, okay? How about this one? McDonald Burger. Yeah, Big Eater. Okay. Uh, Chris P. Bacon. <laughs> Can't you hear that in Walmart calling Mr. Bacon? Mr. Chris P. Bacon? Uh-huh. Okay. How about Sue Yu? <laughs> you know what? It is absolutely true. I looked it up. Sue Yu is an attorney. Right? Your name goes before you. Cookie cutter. It's just like everybody else. Uh, I don't know what to make of that one. Okay. Filet. Fillet. I don't know. Okay. Our good friend Gene Poole. Yep. How about this one? Your aunt, Albatross. <laughs> How about this one? Always someone. Paige Turner. Mm -hmm. And my favorite, Wrigley Fields. Wrigley Fields, yeah. After the service, uh, Bill Price, some of you guys know Bill Price. He's our banjo player, the only banjo player north of the Mason-Dixon line. Okay, but anyway, he, he came to me after the service. He said, no kidding, Pastor. He said, I went to uh, high school with a girl. Her name was Candy Kane. Candy Kane. And then you know what he said? What did he say? She was sweet. Yeah, she was sweet. Okay. Uh, but anyway, regardless of what your name is, names are used to, to a, we're addressed by our name, and often they end up being very revealing because obviously we can be addressed in one of two ways based on our name. Either by our first name or by our last name. And it's kind of a badge of honor and maybe the ultimate uh, name drop to, to let someone know that you and a famous person are on what we might call a first name basis. And I want you to know, and I'm not bragging, but I want you to know I'm on a first name basis with some pretty famous people. Like, for instance, I'm on a first name basis with Madonna and Cher and Bono, and Adele, and Sting, and Eminem, and Oprah, and Mr. T, sort of. And you go, well, yeah, but everybody is on a first name basis with them because everybody knows them by their first name. And most of the time, unless you're being very presumptive, you're only on a first name basis with people that you know and have a close relationship with. And you're not on a first name basis with people that you don't know that well or someone that you've uh, just met. So there's something kind of special about being on a first name basis with people. And maybe the single most amazing thing is that the God who created the universe, and the God who created you and everyone else and everything in it, this most amazing God who loves you so much wants to be on a first name basis with you. And that's radical because his name isn't just any other name. His name isn't just any other common name. We read a little bit in Philippians chapter 2 last week where it says that uh, he was given the name that is above every name. That at that name of Jesus every knee should bow uh, in heaven and on earth and under the earth and everywhere and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Part of the mystery of his name is that he's known by more than one name. 2,700 years ago, a prophet by the name of Isaiah gave us some of these names that he's known by. That this God who not only created us, but this God who at Christmas came to be one of us so that we could know him, and not only know him, we could know him, you could know him on a first name basis. On a first name basis. Isaiah chapter 9, if you got your Bibles, we're going to read just, really just focus on this one verse this morning. So if you don't have a Bible, there's one underneath the seat front of you, you could kind of read through that 
that whole prophecy. If you don't want to do that, uh, we'll have the uh, verses up on the uh, Jumbo Baptistron here, 5,000, that projects everything. So, uh, 700 years before Christ, this prophet explained Christmas before anyone had ever experienced Christmas. Seven centuries before the, the star was shining in the east and, and the cradle in the manger was rocking and the wise men were giving and, and angels were singing. Long before that, God revealed to this prophet Isaiah the amazing and yet mysterious names of this baby born in Bethlehem that will unfold to us this morning. So what, what's in a name? Well, we know him by the name of Jesus. You will call his name Jesus. But do you know what? Jesus was a very common name in first century Jerusalem. There were lots of little boys in Israel running around with the name Jesus, but no one quite like this one. Let's read God's word out loud this morning. This is Isaiah 9, verse 6. Pretty famous passage maybe to, to some of you, maybe not to others. But this is Isaiah's prophecy about this baby that would be born in Bethlehem. Let's read it out loud together. Here we go. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. For unto us a child is born. It's no mystery that you and I can relate to the humanity of Jesus. Because he came into the world in the way that you and I came into the world. He was born as a baby, born as an infant. Had a physical body just like we do and just like ours. It sometimes cooperates with us, sometimes not. He was born and he grew and he developed and... He had all the pain and difficulties involved with those processes. He had a particular ethnicity. Have you thought about that? He was Jewish. He had a particular ethnic background just like all of us do because no one is what we would call generic. We all have a particular uh, genetic and ethnic and racial makeup. Jesus had the same just like all of us. He had relatives. He eventually had brothers and sisters. Wouldn't you hate to be a brother or sister of Jesus, right? Who do you hate to be the one telling on Jesus? Jesus is pulling my hair. Make him stop, right? God says you deserve it. Can you see it though? Who, you know, why does Jesus never get punished? Why does he think he's so perfect? Who made him God? That's a good question. But imagine what it would have been like for his brothers and sisters dealing with him and for him dealing with them. I would suspect as a child, as a teenager, certain maybe even as an adult, that line between fully human, being fully human, and that line between that and sinning might have been pretty thin in some of those cases. But we know that Jesus had feelings like we do, got thirsty, got hungry, tired, sad, he walked and talked, he slept, just like us, he died. Died. He was given by a heavenly father, but he was born to an earthly mother. And it is a mystery. It is the greatest mystery of all. This incarnation of how God could become one of us. And we may not fully understand it. This baby God in the flesh became just like us. And maybe if it doesn't tell you anything else. If it doesn't tell you anything else that tells all of us this. He gets it. He gets it. When you've lost everything that you spent your life working for. If that happens to you. He gets it. When you're rejected for doing what's right, he gets it. When you're betrayed and sold down the river by someone that you trusted, he gets it. When you're crushed by the death of someone that you love, he gets it. No matter what you're going through, he knows how you feel. You are on a first name basis with the God who created the universe came to be one of us. We can relate to that. We rejoice in his divinity. To us, a child was born. And I think really these are emphasizing two different things. To us, a child was born. To us, a son is given. A child was born. He came into the same world like you and I. A son is given. He is the eternal son of the eternal father. And in that sense, for Christmas, he is not only the gift of Christmas, he's also the giver of Christmas. Maybe the, well, maybe the greatest verse in the Bible, certainly the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. So as a child, Jesus was born to, to live with us in his humanity. As a son, as the son of God, he was given to us in his divinity. And that's what makes him so 
unbelievably unique. He was like us in his humanity so we can relate to him and he relates to us. He was unlike us in his divinity so that he could be a savior for us. So that he could die in our place. And so we rejoice in that. We relate to the fact that he was human. We rejoice in the fact that he was divine. And then you can't miss this. We respond to his authority. We respond to the authority of Jesus. This is a peculiar part of this verse. And the government will be upon his shoulders. This child that was born, this son that is given, is also the king that will rule the world. Came to redeem us and then to reign over the entire world. Now you hear that phrase, this government will be upon his shoulders. And, and maybe you hear that and you think, is he sure he wants the government on his shoulders? Especially this government, because we can't seem to agree about our government. And we're always divided and torn over all earthly governments. And the truth is, because government can be a, a, an institution and, a, and an authority that honors God, but just as easily, government and governments can be an institution and an authority that dishonors God because government is human and flawed, never perfect, just like all of us. So government can honor God, government can dishonor God, and isn't one of our biggest problems, we can't agree on the difference. Which is why we argue about things with government and have different perspectives about government, about all these different issues. How is it that people who otherwise love each other and can talk civilly to each other start talking about government and they're ready to kill each other? And some of you are going, were you at my Thanksgiving dinner, Pastor? How, did you, how do you know that? Listen, when you surrender and follow Jesus, you respond to a greater authority. Matthew chapter 28, the beginning of what we call the Great Commission, Jesus sending his followers, you and I, sending his disciples out into the world. He prefaces that by saying this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I have all authority. I'm the fully righteous government. And the day will come when, 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 his, when his rule is fully manifest all over the world. That there won't need, we won't need a, a legislative branch because he's the lawgiver. We won't need a judicial branch because he's a righteous judge. We won't need an executive branch because he is not only a king, but he is the king of kings. And nobody will vote him into office or vo vote him out of office. He will rule and reign. The prophet uh, Zechariah talks about that. Isaiah, uh, in the verses after the one we read, continue to talk about the greatness of his government that will be established and will never end will never end. Let that sink in. There'll never be an end to his government. They'll, they'll, one day there'll be no revolution against his government. There'll be no rebellion against it. There'll be no rejection of it. Because there'll be no reason for any of those things. And at that moment and only then, will there be not just one nation. There'll be one universe under God with liberty and justice for all. But Christmas reveals that that authority is not just something that comes sometime in the future. But that authority comes personally in Jesus for us now. For your life and for my life now. For our lives together as the church now. That we might manifest Jesus' rule and reign in our lives to our world right where we are. That's how we respond to his authority. Uh, and he's come into the world and he knows you by name. I, I love Luke chapter 2, the great part of the Christmas story. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah the Lord. But that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. Now, not of this sermon. We're about halfway through this. That's not the, it's not the beginning of this. Uh, but the prophet Isaiah begins to drop names of this God who has come to be with us. He begins to sort of drop these names. Now, normally we don't like name dropping. We hate name dropping. We don't like that. Uh, you know, by the way, and, and you know what that is, right? Where you sort of mention the names of famous people that you know and and have, have been around or something like that. Because it, it makes you feel better or something. Status. You know who never did that? Somebody famous who never did that? Uh, the Reverend Billy Graham never did that. Most famous evangelist. He hung with presidents and hobnobbed with the powerful all over the world. And he never bragged about it. And do you know how I know that? I heard that directly from Billy himself when we were hanging out at Starbucks. That's, that's what I heard. I'm just kidding. Uh, Billy hates Starbucks. We hung out at Denny's. So anyway, but that name dropping... Right? To try to make you look good or to, or, or to build up your own self-esteem. But the God who embodies these names, you really can know him. And the deep and personal content represented by these names. I, I, I love this quote. I saw it this week. This is uh, 
the sort of pop star artist Lady Gaga. That put this quote on your outline. Uh, it, you probably don't know her personally. But anyway, uh, here's what she writes. She said, Lady Gaga is my name. If you know me and you call me Stephanie, you don't really know me at all. Listen, if you really know Jesus... You will know him by these names that the prophet gives. And what are the names that the prophet Isaiah drops on us this morning? What are those names that you will know Jesus personally by? The first one is Wonderful Counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. Now, I think all of us would say, in in just pure honesty, we need some good We need some good counsel. I was getting some good counsel right before this service. We all need some good counsel. No no matter what your sort of social thing is or education or financial status, we need good counsel because we don't have within us everything we need to make life work the way that it ought to because life is hard and we are sinful. And those are the facts. So there are people, and and you've experienced this, and there are people who can make their careers work and they're really thriving like that, but, but then they struggle with their marriage maybe or with their family life. And then there are people who are the opposite. They're doing pretty good working on some relationships, but they can't, they can't get this career thing and kind of what they need to be doing in, in life off the ground. So you've got people who can climb to the top of the ladder and then they get there and find out it's, it's up against the wrong wall and, and life is filled with pressure. And there are people always getting ready to live and never quite living life to the fullest. So we seek out counsel for problems. Problems without, problems within, a combination of the two. And fortunately, we live in a time and a place when good counsel is available. Now, every now and then people seek bad counsel. Have you seen these? Palm reader. We were out in the country the other day, west of here, heading to Elburn. That's where we were actually going. And I saw one. I think actually the one I saw just said fortune teller. And all this kind of thing. And I said, really, do people... I'm not going to ask you to raise a hand if you've ever sought counsel from one of these. But I asked myself, I thought, do people really seek... Do people really go there and seek advice and and counsel? And I would say to you, I would never go to a fortune teller unless they had won the lottery. If there's a fortune teller who's won the lottery, uh, maybe, give it a shot. I don't know. You never see that. Fortune teller wins the lottery. But you seek wise counsel. There, there's unwise counsel out there. Well, you, you've got to seek it where it's wise, whether it's professionally or whether it's someone that you personally confide in. Because doesn't every one of us have that person, that friend, who can tell everybody else how to live their life, but that person's own life is a wreck? So you've got a friend like, you got a friend like that or you are that friend, can tell everybody else how to do it, but can't live their own life in the right way. And so we seek counseling. And we have more counseling and counselors than ever before, yet we also have more problems. And it's not that we need less counseling. We don't. And it's probably not even that we need better counseling. It's just that what we all need is a wonderful counselor. We need good counseling. We need excellent counselors. And that's what we call in philosophy necessary but not sufficient. It's necessary because you absolutely have to have it, but it's not quite enough. Because all of us need a wonderful counselor. By the way, it's not enough to just seek counsel from others because of the fact that our hearts deceive us. And so sometimes even with the best, even with the best advice and someone's really honest with us, our hearts deceive us. Jeremiah says that, Jeremiah chapter 9. In that great verse, it's up there, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond pure. Who can understand it? So you can fool yourself even if you get the best counsel. By the way, verse 10, which is not up there, says, I the Lord understand. All the things of the heart. You have a wonderful counselor who understands that. And our minds are limited. Romans 12, don't conform yourself to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Sometimes even the wisest counsel cannot get through the limitation of a mind conformed by sin to this world. But you're not limited to just good counsel or even a great counselor. You are on a first name basis with a wonderful counselor, a wonderful counselor. You know his name, follow him as your guide. Follow him as your guide. You say, how do do we access that counsel of this wonderful counselor? Let me give you real quick these things. Uh, This is not on your outline, but I think this is important for us to know. How how do we get that? How do we have access to the, the wonderful counsel of a wonderful counselor? Here's the first thing. Go to the word of God. Go directly to the Word of God. There it is. Go to the Word of God. Because there is probably not anything in your life that 
there's not somewhere, something that the Word of God speaks pretty directly to that. So go directly to the Word of God. God's wisdom and counsel is there for you. Here's the second one. Draw near to the Spirit of God. It's the Spirit who helps you see that. It's the Spirit who illuminates that in our lives. So, so that you not only have wise counsel on the outside that you can access, you have wise counsel on the inside. The Spirit of God helping you understand the things of God. And, and then the last one, look to the people of God. Look to the people of God. This is why I believe in the church. This is why I love the church. This is why we tell people it's, it's not enough to attend the church. You have to be part of the church because in the church, God brings godly people into your life who have godly wisdom and are able to give you godly counsel. And in the church, in the body of Christ, that wisdom and counsel accumulates. It accumulates as you are here. It sort of reminds me, there's this great funny saying about universities, about colleges. And the saying goes something like this, that, that universities are storehouses of knowledge. Storehouses of knowledge. And then they explain how that could be. And it goes like this, freshmen bring a little in, seniors don't take much away, so knowledge sort of accumulates there. <laughs> well, maybe that's true. But wisdom accumulates within the body of Christ. Because though, uh, though none of us bring much of it in, all of us have full access to a wonderful counselor who is always giving it out to us as much as we're willing to receive. And then we have it to share with others. And so you have the name of a wonderful counselor. You know his name, follow him, as your God. You know his name. Worship him as your God. Worship him as your God. I, th that really is an audacious claim for a baby, isn't it? Born in first century Bethlehem, if you stop and think about it. Audacious claim. When, when, when you look at our world and at our lives and, and all the things that we need counsel and direction for and all the things that are broken and chaotic and, and even evil in our world, that we actually make this sort of Audacious claim, as Ray Ortland said, God's answer to everything that has ever terrorized us is a child. This baby born in Bethlehem. And then on this child, the prophet drops the name Mighty God. Mighty God. That's a strange name for a baby, isn't it? You imagine this. You know, imagine you open a birth announcement from some friends of yours. And there's a charming picture of a precious baby boy and the details of his birth. He was born uh, December 6, 2019, 8 pounds, 3 ounces, 23 inches long. And his name is not Jeff, it's not Kevin, it's not Liam, it's not even Maximus. His name is Mighty God. Mighty God. And you know what you think. You go, did Kanye and Kim have another baby? Did we not know about that? And you're name dropping, right? Because they sent you an announcement of it. Nobody else got one. That's a bold name for a baby. But it's who this baby is. Jesus, mighty God. He was not a man who became God. That, that's impossible. He was God who became a man. And all you Marvel comic fans can understand this perfectly. Because you can put it this way. Clark Kent cannot become Superman. But Superman can become Clark Kent. So everything that God is, Jesus is because he's God. Everything God has, Jesus has because he's God. Everything God does, Jesus does because he's God. That's why he's such a wonderful counselor. And here's the difference between him and everyone else. Any good counselor can tell you the right thing to do. But no other counselor can empower you to do that. Can energize you to do that. Jesus can do both. He can tell you in any situation what you need to do. He can also empower you to do that because he's a mighty God. First John uh, chapter 5, John says he's true God and eternal life. And you and he are on a first name basis. So you know his name, and we'll close with this. It's the best name ever. It is the best name ever. Let me ask you this question. How many, well, I better not ask you to raise your hands. But, but how many of you just think through this? How many of you like your name? How many of you like your name? Some of you will be thinking, no, you know, I wish I had another name. When I was a kid, I did not like my name. Uh, I, I, wanted to be, I wanted my name to be Steve because I watched this show. Do you remember this? Some of you remember this show. It's Hawaii Five, the original one. And, and the main character on there, his name was Steve McGarrett. 
And I always wanted to be Steve McGarrett because he was this cool, smart, tough guy. And I wasn't any of those things. So I liked his name better than, better than mine. And some people are like that, right? They don't like the name. And, of course, you could change your name if you wanted a, if you wanted a different name. You could change your name. Mitch uh, Hedberg, a late comedian, said this. He said, I wish my name was Brian because maybe sometimes people would misspell my name and call me Brain. And that's like a free compliment, and you don't even got to be smart to notice it. The mystery of Jesus' name is he has the best name ever because, as Acts 4.12 says, salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. It is the best name ever. And in his name, your place with God is secure. That great phrase Isaiah drops on us, he is the everlasting father. Or literally in the Hebrew, he is the father of eternity. Father of eternity. So he's the originator. He's the author of all things eternal. Isaiah will say later on in chapter 46, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say, my purpose will stand and I'll do all that I'll please. No beginning, no ending. He's eternal and controls the beginning and ending of everything. Isn't this where he's different from us in a, in a powerful way? You and I, sometimes we, we know the beginning of something, but we don't see how it turns out. And sometimes we see how it turns out, but we don't know how in the world it got there, whether it's good or bad. Everlasting Father sees all these things, eternally sees all these things. And Jesus himself, uh, with that name, it's, it's not, don't be confused, it's not that somehow there's a, there's a confusion between God the Father and God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Son also relates to you and I as a father because he's the embodiment showing us what a good father is like. Philip will ask him the famous verses, John 14, where, where he says, anyone who's seen me has seen the father. Uh, what, what we sometimes don't read in that, so that's preceded by the simple question of Philip asking him, Jesus, show us the father and we'll be satisfied with that. We, we need to see the father and we'll be satisfied. And Jesus responds to that by saying, hey, when you've seen me, you've seen the father. The son sent by the father exactly like the father and through the Son, we come to know the Father. And because Jesus accepts that role to us as a father of his children, we can become one of his children. Here's the interesting thing, and this will be true for you too. Uh, if, you're, if you're an earthly father or mother, you'll be the, you'll be the, the father or the mother all, all the days of your life. So I think, you know, I'll be the father of my son until that day comes that I die, until the day that I die. Hopefully, at 100 years old, playing football in the 2064 Bacon Bowl here at First Baptist Church. So that's the prediction of how I'm going to go out. But moms and dads, your parents are your children until the day you die. Here's the thing. The moment you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you come into God's family, you become one of His children, not only for as long as you live, but for all of eternity. Because He's not an earthly father or an earthly mother. He's an everlasting father. He's an eternal father who will love you for all eternity. He's the everlasting father. And in his name, your place with God is secure. You don't have to worry. Last thing. Uh, in his name, your peace is totally sure. This last name drop, he's the prince of peace. The prince of peace. In this time of year, Christmas, peace on earth, goodwill to men. And we look around and we go, gosh, you know, there doesn't seem to be, maybe there's more goodwill this time of year, but people are still arguing and fighting. There, there's never, not very few years that there's been peace all over the world. There's always some kind of conflict and some kind of violence. So there's not, not this much peace on earth. Sometimes you say, well, maybe I'd just settle for peace and quiet. Sometimes you can't get that either. Sometimes peace and quiet is not available because life is full of difficulties. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. And you've experienced it, haven't you? And if you haven't experienced it yet, if you're not experiencing it now, you know the truth. It's coming. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when. Because in this world, you have trouble. But here's what, here's what Jesus says the entire verse. He said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you'll have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And notice carefully exactly what he says there. In me, you may have peace. I think this is a strange thing, but, but very, very true. Sometimes we don't find peace because peace is exactly what we're looking for. And you don't find peace when you look for peace. You find peace when you look for Jesus. When you seek Jesus, you find peace. This really is one of the best quotes ever. Uh, the great John Wesley said this. He said, when I looked to Jesus, the dove of peace flew into my heart. 
But when I looked at the dove of peace, it flew away. It's true, isn't it? Even this time of year, peace is not secure anywhere in this world. And peace is not secure even in our hearts and lives apart from Jesus himself. But in his name, your peace is totally sure. There are problems, there are storms. No peace on earth and often no peace and quiet. But in the midst of that, you're on a first name basis with the Prince of Peace. You already know his name. He's called you by name. And the mystery of his name, as then when you call on that name, maybe even this very morning, this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this everlasting Father, this Prince of Peace, this Jesus the Messiah, when you call on His name, He will answer you. And He will respond back to you, calling you by your name to know Him, to love Him, and to follow Him. Get to know Him on a first name basis this Christmas. Would you stand with me? Let's pray together this morning.